Nice to see you all. Uh, I have the first slide up, perhaps. I want to thank the organizers of this great deal. They've uh, put a tremendous amount of time into this, so I want to thank them to begin with. And then I'd like to thank all of you for coming out uh, for my talk, especially ignorance. It's always nice to see a lot of support for, uh, for ignorance. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about, um, about ignorance and how it drives science, or how I think it drives science. So there's an, an ancient adage, uh, an old saying, which is that it's, <laughs> ah, it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there's no cat, <laughs> which may happen here. So especially when there's no cat, which I find to be a particularly apt description of science and the way science actually happens. <clears throat> now that's somewhat different than the way many people seem to think it happens. I think there's this idea that science is a well-ordered, rule-driven pursuit taken on by a group of people who follow this thing called the scientific method. But really, you know, an awful lot of it is that, in point of fact. That's really how we get a great deal of it done. And so I want to talk to you about that side of it today, because the scientific method I'm sure you've heard plenty about. Um, this difference between what science is, the way it's pursued versus the way it's perceived, first became apparent to me, I think, in my kind of dual role here at Columbia as a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, where I teach a course on neuroscience, and uh, where I also run a laboratory uh, on the brain, mostly in the sense of smell. And I realized that working in the laboratory with graduate students and postdocs and thinking up ideas for experiments about how we might find this, this or that out about the brain, and learn some more about it, learn about smell, is it's very challenging, it's very exciting, it's frankly kind of exhilarating. It's the best job in the world, as the dean just said. Now at the same time, I was teaching a large course in neuroscience, and that's a big subject, and there's a lot of information that had to be organized, and that was quite challenging, and it was also quite interesting, but it was not, I have to admit, exhilarating. So what was the difference? This was the question for me. Now the course I was and am teaching has the foreboding title, Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience One. Um, and it uses this big textbook, it's 25 hour and 20 minute lectures, it uses this giant textbook called Principles of Neural Science, edited by three eminent neuroscientists here at Columbia, with many of our faculty who have contributed articles to it. I can tell you that the book is uh, 1,414 pages long. It weighs in at a hefty seven and a half pounds. <laughs> and just to put that in some perspective, seven and a half pounds is twice the weight of a normal adult human brain. Well, it's about the brain. To put it maybe in further perspective, here's a side view of the books from on top. And that one on the right-hand side, that big one, that's Principles of Neural Science. That little one next to it, that's Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. <laughs> So I came to realize that after giving the students this book to read through and listening to my 25 lectures full of all sorts of facts, because after all I want, I want to give you your money's worth, so I had a lot of facts in this lecture hung on a few concepts, but I must have been by the end of the course I realized giving students the idea that pretty much everything must be known about the brain in a neuroscience. Well that's clearly not true. And I must also have given them the idea that what we do as scientists is we find crap out and we put it in books like this. We make big encyclopedias and we accumulate more and more of it and we make bigger and bigger books. Actually, this book, that's the fourth edition. The fifth edition just came out this past week and I understand it weighs eight point some odd pounds. I don't know that it weighs weighted, but I've been told it weighs more, as if this were a feat somehow or another to be. So in any case, None of these things was true, and I thought that was the mistake. That was the mistake we were making, because I know as a scientist, when I go to a conference and I meet with my colleagues and we have a beer at the bar afterwards, we don't talk about what we know. We talk about what we don't know, what we need to find out, why we want to find this out versus that, why this is important to know, what we'll do if we can't find this out, all of those sorts of issues. I think this was maybe best described in a quote by Marie Curie, who after gaining her second graduate degree, wrote in a letter to her brother, uh, one never notices what has been done, one only sees what remains to be done. And I think that's the key, what remains to be done. I must say this is one of my favorite pictures of Madame Curie. I'm convinced that that glow behind her is actually her, and not some photographic <laughs> technique. But it turns out actually that her notebooks uh, are still so hot that they're stored at the Bibliothèque Française in a special room, a concrete room that's lead-lined. And if you're a scholar and want to go make use of the books, you have to put on a hazmat radiation suit. 
it's got to be some scholar to do that, I guess. Anyway, this, is, this was, it seemed to me, the key, that we had to begin telling students and others about what remains to be done, because this is what science is built on. So I thought, well, okay, I should start teaching ignorance. <laughs> Finally, something I can actually uh, teach. So I began this course here at Columbia on ignorance uh, and how it drives science and how it makes science happen, and eventually became a book and all the rest of that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that experience. Now, I have to say, <clears throat> I use the word ignorance, of course, to be at least intentionally provocative in part. And ignorance in common usage has some very many very bad connotations, and I don't mean any of those. So I don't mean simple stupidity, or worse than that, willful stupidity, a callow indifference to fact or data. Um, the, the ignorant are unaware, they're unenlightened, <laughs> they're uninformed. So I know, it's a sort of a cheap shot, but I can't really resist. And really, really, I did spend some time thinking of what kind of a graphic I could use for that last paragraph, and that seemed to be the one, so. so, so there, but I do mean a different kind of ignorance, because there is a much less pejorative sense of the word ignorance, and that's the important one. And, and it was best said, I think, by James Clerk Maxwell, possibly the greatest physicist between Newton and Einstein, and he said, thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every advance in science. Thoroughly conscious ignorance. So I thought this is something worth thinking about. Now one way to think about this is to start out briefly by thinking about knowledge, the other side of this. Because we pay a lot of attention to knowledge. And so you know the next slide, knowledge is a big subject. The Berkeley Institute, it's a management institute, calculated that in the year 2003 there were five exabytes of data added to the something or another added to the, to the world. And they, uh, in 2007, updated that with an estimate that by 2012, now we'd have 2,500 exabytes of data out there in the world. Well, what are you possibly going to do with all of that? So we have this sense, I think, of sitting on top of a mountain of data, a nearly impregnable mountain of facts. And this makes science, I feel, seem inaccessible, in particular to the public and, and to students as well. And this is a very dangerous thing, and we maybe get to talk about that towards the end a little bit. But, but we are clearly faced with a tremendous and accelerating, a frighteningly exponential growth of the scientific literature. In 2006, there were 1.3 million scientific papers published. It's an estimated growth rate of about two and a half percent a year. That means that this year we'll have 1.5 plus million scientific papers per, per published in journals. So if there's about 535,000 minutes in a year, that means that there are three new papers per minute. I've been here for a little over, not quite 10 minutes, so there's 30 papers that we haven't read yet. We better get to work. You're sitting here listening to me, and 30 papers have been published. So, so what do we do about that? Well, I think it's important, oh, I forgot I put this graph in here. This, maybe many of you have seen this. This kind of makes the rounds. But, but it's a sort of an idea about how knowledge works, right? So what you know um, versus how much you know about it. And as you can see, there's a very clear focus, focus, focus as you go down. And so there must be a great deal that we don't know. I mean, that's certainly true. I can tell you that the, the nature and science arrive weekly in my laboratory. And I'm thrilled if I can pick out two articles whose titles I can understand, let alone can I understand the articles. Um, so what do we do about this? Well, as I say, knowledge is a big subject, but what I'd like to say is that ignorance is actually a bigger one, and this is a way into an awful lot of science. Now, it's not the only way, and of course facts are important, and I don't mean to demean them, but I think we have adopted a kind of an encyclopedic model of science, an accumulation model of science, which is not really doing us any good, and then we need to refocus a little bit and think about, think about the... Um, uh, the other side of it, the question side of it. So this brings us to a couple of models of science. Here's one of them, this notion that it's a puzzle, that we're, that scientists are patiently piecing together this puzzle and eventually we'll come up with a solution. I think that's dead wrong. First of all, with a puzzle, the manufacturer has guaranteed that there's a solution. We have no such guarantee. We may not even have a manufacturer here. So I think the puzzle idea is wrong. There's also some sense that you can complete it. A similar notion is, the, is, is that of an onion, that we're, you know, we're unwrapping something, that we're peeling away layer after layer to get at some fundamental truth at the, at the center of it. I don't think that's the case either because it's a limited sort of model. Uh, another popular one and a very pretty one is the iceberg, where we only see the tip of the iceberg, but all the good stuff is down below, or so much of it we don't see. But again, there's this notion that it's a single body of, of fact, of, of knowledge that can be gotten to somehow or another. Or 
perhaps if we just wait long enough, it'll melt away at this point, I suppose. Um, I, I prefer a slightly more dynamic image of science, if, if also maybe more poetic, and that is maybe something like ripples on a pond or a balloon blowing up, that as the, as the body of knowledge gets larger and larger, the inside of that circle, and the circumference also grows. The amount of it that's in touch with the outside ignorance continues to grow as well. So that with knowledge, ignorance grows. This idea, I think, was, was brought out in a wonderful quote from George Bernard Shaw. This is actually from a toast that he was delivering at a dinner celebrating Albert Einstein. So this was delivered to Einstein in which he says, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without creating 10 more. Which I think is just glorious. I mean, it's going to keep me at work anyway, so that's very good. As it turns out, he probably cribbed this from Immanuel Kant, who some hundred or so years earlier came up with something called the principle of question propagation, that every answer given on principle of experience begets a fresh question. The same idea that, that answers lead to better questions. Of course, Shaw, in his inimitable way, increased it by an order of magnitude, but that's okay, he's probably right. So I think this is the way most of us think that you start out in ignorance, and then you accumulate facts, you accumulate things, and you become more knowledgeable. I would say it's really the other way around. The most important part of it is the other way around. You get a little knowledge so that you can better define the ignorance that you have to go after. The purpose of knowledge is to create higher quality ignorance. Because ignorance comes in different levels. It's not all the same thing. There's low quality ignorance, high quality ignorance. And this is what scientists argue about and debate about. Sometimes we call them bull sessions and sometimes we call them grant proposals. But basically, this is what we argue about. Um, of course, the arrow does go both ways, I know, and all the rest of that, but I think we don't spend enough time thinking about the way knowledge generates ignorance. So ignorance, what we don't know. But then again, there's also the kind of problem, I'm going to go through this quickly because I don't want to run out of time near the end. Uh, there's also the problem, of course, of, of potential cognitive limits to what we don't know. This was brought out by Donald Rumsfeld, nonetheless, no, no other, in this famous phrase, for which he was ridiculed, but it's actually quite clever. So he was worried not only about the, the things we don't know, but the things we don't know we don't know. The not only known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns, which are quite possible. And again, this is the purpose of knowledge, I think, is to get us to understand these unknown unknowns. Things that a generation ago, the question couldn't have even been asked. This is what I would consider progress. J.B.S. Haldane, a great mathematical biologist, one of the early champions in, in, uh, of uh, evolution, once said, not only is the universe queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine. Although I don't think it's any queerer than that suit that he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Where we got that. <laughs> um, so, um, so where does this leave us? Now, I'm, I'm rushing through a bit of this, and I'm just hoping that you'll pick up some ideas from this that you'll think about yourself, really, because we could develop this for much longer. But so, so this does lead us to one dangerous area that I think we have to be careful of because it's where it interfaces with the public. So what are the values of science? I would say they're ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty. But as you well know, this doesn't play so well on the 5 o'clock news or in the Science Times. And this is a difficult problem. Science, scientific progress, if you'll go with me this far, generates ignorance, of course, better and better ignorance. But nonetheless, if you think that ignorance might equal uncertainty and that uncertainty equals doubt, then is science just creating uncertainty and doubt? And I would say the answer is a resounding yes. That's exactly what it does. But what's critical to understand here and what's critical to communicate to a wider public Oops, sorry, this may flip off. No, I oh, guess. That uncertainty is not equivalent to unreliability, and that unsettled science is not unsound science. And this is crucial because, as you well know, in things like climate control and many other issues, uh, one of the things that happens is people want, demand that, that we give them the exact answer rather than just some, well, it could be this or it could be that. We still have to work on it. But that's the true answer, is that there's a certain doubt. I'll go through this very quickly. This is actually something David Halfan, a professor of astronomy here, developed his ideas of perspective on the weather from primitive thinking to scientific thinking that early man might have said, well, the wind is angry on a day like today, you know, and then only a little bit more sophisticated perhaps is the wind god is angry and sacrifice a couple of virgins. And then finally we come to the sort of scientific view of it, which is the wind is a measurable form of energy. Now, arguably the first two of those statements are complete and total explanations. They're wrong, but they're total and complete explanations. The third one of them actually defines our ignorance. It says we can measure this, we can begin to think about it, here are the things we might ask about it, maybe one day we'll be able to predict something about it. But that's the phrase that I think gives us a place to go. 
So um, this is a wonderful quote from Erwin Schrodinger, the great quantum physicist and, in my opinion, philosopher, that in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period. Let me finish quickly here and just tell you why I think uncertainty is such a difficult thing to manage, because this noggin up here wasn't made for it. It doesn't like uncertainty, it likes certain things, but we have to figure out a way to work with uncertainty. That's what makes us sophisticated, if you will. So one of the areas you can see this is a very quick demonstration is what we call ambiguous figures. Um, these are these kind of uh, visual illusions that you've all seen. One of the more famous ones is this one. So this comes from a New Yorker cartoon actually using this figure in which a beautiful young woman looking away at her friend is saying, I'm turning into my mother. And she's saying that because if you also look this way, you see that she's also the profile of an ugly old hag. So both of those images are there at the same time. Even if I now take this one away, you can see the beautiful woman looking away or the old hag in profile. There's another one of these, is called the, fam the famous one is called the Necker Cube, which I'm sure many of you have seen too. Now, some of you will see this cube as pointing down to the left and some pointing down to the right. Some of you will see it going into the screen, some out. Sometimes if you change the lighting, the shadow around it, it changes it, but that's not necessary. You can just keep looking at it and you'll see that it flips back and forth on you. Now, the crucial thing about both of these is that you never see a transition moment. Your brain flips from one certainty to another certainty, even though they have nothing to do with each other particularly. You never stop in a transitional moment. I'll show you one last example of this because I think it's kind of cool. This is, a, this is gonna be a film now. This is a little demonstration I found, believe it or not, in the basement of an old building in the Marais district in Paris. It's a magic museum. It's called the Two Brothers. So this is gonna happen very slowly. This wheel is gonna turn. That's somebody's hand there. I can't remember who I did this on my iPhone. Um, so watch this, watch the figure now as this turns. Well, it should be turning more slowly and smoothly than that, but... So you see, even when you go, and, and the real film is actually quite slow and, and not jumpy, but you see that there's still no transition moment. That no matter how smooth you make that, you flip from one to the other. And so it's this need for certainty that we have to kind of fight against in science because uncertainty is what we really want. The values of science are not fact, surety, conviction, they are indeed instead ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty. And I'll leave you then by just giving you the Schrodinger quote once again, that in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period of time. So thank you very much for your attention.